thanks to all of you for being here tonight. This is uh, really a privilege and a joy for me to be here speaking to you uh, this evening. Trinity, over the years, has been blessed with a number of very capable and distinguished uh, public lecturers in, in the Jan term uh, weeks that we have classes here, and, and I feel very privileged and blessed to be one of them uh, this year. Uh, grateful to Erica Moore, our academic dean, uh, who invited me, and um, all, all you who have made this possible tonight. So as, as Jeff mentioned, I want to talk about the Lord's Prayer. I've just completed a little book uh, on the Lord's Prayer. I was invited to write this book for a brand new series called Christian Essentials uh, that has been launched by a little press in Washington State called Lexum. Some of you may have heard of Logos Bible Software, which is probably the premier uh, Bible software program available in the world today, and they have a, a print publisher uh, called Lexum, and they uh, devised this series uh, of books that could be used in parish settings for catechesis. Uh, the first volume was released a couple of years ago on the Apostles' Creed. Uh, another volume will be coming out next month on the Ten Commandments, on the Decalogue, written by Peter Lightheart. And uh, I was asked to contribute the volume on the Lord's Prayer, which was a great honor uh, for me. I had not planned to write on the Lord's Prayer. I, of course, pray it uh, frequently, as I assume all of us do here tonight, but I had not planned to write on it. And so it was a surprise and a, a joyful surprise when I received this invitation. And as I started to uh, pray about it and ponder what might I say about this prayer, I found myself reaching on my shelf for one of my favorite little books, um, a, a little tiny book, about 75 pages, called Being Christian by Rowan Williams, the former Archbishop of Canterbury. And uh, the final chapter in that book is about prayer. And Rowan says very beautifully in that book that when we begin to pray the Lord's Prayer, the very opening words, Our Father, are... Jesus, the Son of God, inviting us into the relationship of intimacy that He has enjoyed from all eternity with His Father. I want to read you a portion of what Rowan writes because I, I just think it's, it's unsurpassed in terms of expressing the, the heart of the Lord's Prayer. This is a little bit lengthy, so uh, I beg your patience. Bear with me as I read this, but I think you'll find this uh, moving as I have. Rowan says this, for the Christian to pray before all else is to let Jesus' prayer happen in you. The prayer that Jesus himself taught his disciples expresses this very clearly. Our Father. We begin by expressing the confidence that we stand where Jesus stands, and we can say what Jesus says. Some kinds of instruction in prayer used to say at the beginning, put yourself in the presence of God. But I often wonder, says Rowan, whether it would be more helpful to say, put yourself in the place of Jesus. It sounds appallingly ambitious, even presumptuous, but that is actually what the New Testament suggests that we do. Jesus speaks to God for us, but we speak to God in him. You may say what you want in prayer, but he is speaking to the Father, gazing into the depths of the Father's love. And as you understand Jesus better, as you grow up a little in your faith, then what you want to say gradually shifts a bit more into alignment with what he is always saying to the Father in his eternal love for the eternal love out of which his own life streams forth. That, in a nutshell, says Rowan, is prayer. Letting Jesus pray in you <clears throat> and beginning that lengthy 
and often very tough process by which our selfish thoughts and ideals and hopes are gradually aligned with his eternal action. Just as in his own earthly life, his human hopes and fears and desires and emotions are put into the context of his love for the Father, woven into his eternal relation with the Father. Even in that moment of supreme pain and mental agony that he endures the night before his death. So, Rowan concludes, it shouldn't surprise us that Jesus begins his instructions on prayer by telling us to affirm that we stand where he stands, our Father. Everything that follows is bathed in the light of that relationship. Well, how does that happen? How does it happen in the biblical storyline that we find ourselves standing in the place where Jesus stands? That we find ourselves able to take on our lips the name that he uses for God, Father. The story actually begins well before Jesus appears in Palestine. The story begins in the Old Testament with Israel. Israel is the first instance of God having a son. Listen to these words from Exodus chapter 4. The Lord comes to Moses as he sees his people in bondage, in slavery, in Egypt. He comes to Moses and says, when you go back to Egypt as my appointed representative to announce freedom for the captives. See that you perform before Pharaoh all the wonders that I have put in your power, but I will harden his heart so that he will not let the people go. And then you, Moses, shall say to Pharaoh, thus says the Lord, Israel is my firstborn son. I said to you, let my son go that he may worship me. And of course, what happens through the miracle of the Exodus is that God's son, Israel, is liberated from captivity in Egypt and brought into the land of promise where Israel now worships God and knows God as father. And subsequently, in Israel's history, the prophets call Israel back again and again to that fundamental identity, that fundamental relationship to the God who liberated them from slavery. Listen to how the prophet Jeremiah puts it in Jeremiah 31. We, we heard this read in the context of our Eucharistic liturgy on Wednesday morning. Thus says the Lord, sing aloud with gladness for Jacob. And raise shouts for the chief of the nations. Proclaim, give praise, and say, Save, O Lord, your people, the remnant of Israel. See, I am going to bring them from the land of the north and gather them from the farthest parts of the earth. Among them, the blind and the lame, those with child and those in labor together, a great company, they shall return here. With weeping they shall come, and with consolations I will lead them back. I will let them walk by brooks of water in a straight path in which they shall not stumble, for I have become a father to Israel, and Ephraim is my firstborn." Again and again, God's spokesmen, the prophets, call idolatrous Israel back to the worship of her father, back to the worship of the one who liberated Israel and adopted Israel to be God's son at the Exodus. Well, as you go on throughout the Old Testament, this imagery of God as father and Israel as son comes to be focused or concentrated, we might say, on the king of Israel, on David. In 2 Samuel chapter 7, one of the key hinge moments of the entire narrative of the Old Testament, God, through the prophet Nathan, speaks to David as a son. Listen to these words from 2 Samuel chapter 7. When your days, David, are fulfilled and you lie down with your ancestors, 
I will raise up your offspring after you who shall come forth from your body and I will establish his kingdom. He shall build a house for my name and I will establish the throne of his kingdom forever. I will be a father to him and he shall be a son to me. When he commits iniquity, I will punish him with a rod such as mortals use, with blows inflicted by human beings, but I will not take my steadfast love from him as I took it from Saul, whom I put away from before you. Your house and your kingdom shall be made sure forever before me. Your throne shall be established forever." God is now taking this language of sonship and concentrating it, focusing it on Israel's king, the Davidic dynasty, the Davidic line. Above all, perhaps, we see it in the second psalm as the psalmist says this, I will tell of the decree of the Lord. He, the Lord, said to me, you are my son. Today I have begotten you. This is a messianic psalm a Davidic psalm. Ask of me, the Lord says, and I will make the nations your heritage and the ends of the earth your possession. So when we arrive at the climax of the biblical narrative, when Jesus appears as the herald of the kingdom of God, as the long-awaited heir of David, and as he's known throughout the Gospels, throughout the New Testament, as the Son of God, the Son of David. Jesus is gathering to himself all of that Old Testament imagery. He is saying, I am the true embodiment of Israel. I am now taking the mantle of Israel on my own shoulders. I am the true and greater David. I am the long-awaited fulfillment of the messianic line. I am the Son of God. But Jesus is saying even more than that. He didn't only become Son through his baptism, through his missionary appearance in Israel. More mysteriously, more wondrously, he has always been Son. There's a telling moment in the Gospel of Matthew in chapter 22 when the Pharisees are gathered together to test Jesus. Jesus comes to them and poses a question to the Pharisees. He says, what do you think of the Messiah? Whose son is he? They said to him, the son of David. He said to them, how is it then that David, by the Spirit, calls him Lord? saying, the Lord said to my Lord, sit at my right hand until I put your enemies under your feet. Then Jesus drops the bombshell. He says, if David thus calls him Lord, how can he be his son? No one was able to give him an answer, nor from that day did anyone dare to ask him any more questions. Jesus is not denying his role as the heir of David. He's not denying that he's the son of David. What he is denying is that he is only the son of David. He is greater than David insofar as he is the eternal son of God who has now appeared in these latter days as the Messiah, but he did not then become the son. He has always been the son in eternal relationship to his father, Listen to how he puts it in the great high priestly prayer in John chapter 17. After Jesus had spoken these words, he he looked up to heaven and said, Father, the hour has come. Glorify your Son so that the Son may glorify you. Since you have given him authority over all people to give eternal life to all whom you have given him, and this is eternal life, that they may know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ whom you have sent. I glorified you on earth by finishing the work that you gave me to do. So now, Father, don't miss this, 
Glorify me in your own presence with the glory that I had in your presence before the world existed. The son of David, who has appeared for our salvation in these latter days, has always existed in eternal intimacy with the one he calls father. There was never a time when he was not the son. There was never a time when his father was not the father. And wondrously, mysteriously, that relationship is what you and I are invited to participate in when we take on our lips the prayer that Jesus taught his disciples to pray. We are ushered in to the very intimacy that has always existed from before the foundation of the world between the Father and the Son in the mutual love of their spirit. There are two passages in the New Testament from St. Paul's epistles that capture this so beautifully. First, in Galatians chapter 4, Paul says this, When the fullness of time had come, God sent his son, born of a woman, born under the law, in order to redeem those who were under the law, so that we might receive adoption as children. And because you are children, God has sent the spirit of his son into our hearts, crying, Abba, Father. So you are no longer a slave, but a child. And if a child, then also an heir through God. What Paul is describing there is the way through the redemptive work of Jesus, we have been enabled to share in the prayer of intimacy that Jesus prays to his Father. Jesus cries out in that Aramaic word of intimacy, Abba. And as Jesus dies for us and rises on our behalf and sends his Holy Spirit to indwell us, that very Spirit prompts within us the same cry that Jesus addresses to God. We, too, join Jesus in saying, Abba, Father. Paul elaborates in Romans chapter 8. He says this, For all of us who are led by the Spirit of God are children of God. For you did not receive a spirit of slavery to fall back into fear, but you have received a spirit of adoption. When we cry, Abba, Father, it is that very spirit bearing witness with our spirit that we are children of God. And if children, then heirs, heirs of God and joint heirs with Christ, if in fact we suffer with him so that we may also be glorified with him. Paul is thinking here of the ancient household and he's contrasting the status of slaves who could not inherit the master's fortune with the status of children, those who are born free, those who have easy and happy intimacy with their father. Paul is saying we've been liberated from slavery to sin and death. We are not left out in the cold. We are, in fact, younger siblings of Jesus, the heir. And if he's the heir, we are now joint heirs along with him. We are now caught up in the relationship that he enjoys with his father, that he has enjoyed from all eternity. This privilege is ours by adoption. Adoption is the great underpinning of the Lord's Prayer, friends. I love the way the evangelical theologian J.I. Packer uh, puts this. In his book, Knowing God, he, he says that adoption is the greatest privilege of the Christian. Listen to how he says it. What is a Christian, he writes. The question can be answered in many ways, but the richest answer I know is that a Christian is one who has God as father. You sum up the whole of the New Testament teaching in a single phrase if you speak of it as a revelation of the fatherhood of the holy creator. 
In the same way, you sum up the whole of New Testament religion or New Testament piety, we might say, New Testament spirituality, if you describe it as the knowledge of God as one's holy father. If you want to judge how well a person understands Christianity, Packer says, find out how much he or she makes of the thought of being God's child and having God as his or her father. If this is not the thought that prompts and controls the worship and prayers and the whole outlook on life of the Christian, it means that he or she does not understand Christianity very well at all. For everything that Christ taught is summed up in the knowledge of the fatherhood of God. Father is the Christian name for God. Our understanding of Christianity cannot be better than our grasp of adoption. Adoption is the highest privilege that the gospel offers. Higher even than justification. To be right with God the judge is a great thing. But to be loved and cared for by God the Father is greater. Isn't that lovely? That's the foundation, friends, of how you and I are able to pray the Lord's Prayer. We have been adopted by God the Father. We are now his children. And so we can say with with boldness or with cheek, as Rowan Williams puts it very Britishly, uh, we can say boldly, cheekily, our Father. We can barge into the throne room of God and climb into God's presence and expect that he will listen to us and hear us because we have been made his children through the gospel. So what I'd like to do is walk through uh, briefly, just simply petition by petition, uh, the Lord's Prayer. And I'd like you to have in your mind as I do this, the questions, how does Jesus model the prayer that he teaches us? And how do we join him, our elder brother and fellow heir, in praying this prayer alongside him, through him? in his name, and uh, through his work on our behalf. Let's take this briefly, phrase by phrase, in the incomparable King James uh, Version. Our Father, who art in heaven. Jesus addresses God with the intimate name Father. On lonely mountaintops, within earshot of his followers, On the night of his betrayal and arrest, he takes his place as the true heir of Israel and son of David, calling on God as Abba. But more than that, he shows us that he has known God as his father from all eternity. There has never been a time when he was not son and the father not his father. He is, as the creed puts it, God from God, begotten of his Father before all ages. Begotten, not created, not made. When he takes Israel and David's language on his lips, he does so as the one to whom that language pointed all along. He is the unique Son, the only begotten, the co-eternal Son of the eternal Father. And we, through him, now name God as our Father, too. We, you and I, are not sons and daughters of God by nature, but by adoption. The prophet Zechariah foretold that in the latter days, ten men from nations of every language shall take hold of a Jew, grasping his garment and saying, let us go with you for we have heard that God is with you. Those 10 men that Zechariah foresaw are the Gentiles who grasp the hem of the Jew, Jesus, and come to share in Jesus' relation with God, his Father. We become Jesus' younger siblings and fellow heirs. He lets us call God Father alongside him, through him, in him. Hallowed be thy name, he prays. 
Indeed, we might even say that his whole life consists in praying that prayer. His entire earthly mission is to magnify his Father's name, to shed abroad his Father's glory, to exalt and honor his Father's reputation. On the eve of his crucifixion, Jesus prays in the so-called high priestly prayer that he might glorify the Father's name decisively and climactically. He puts it like this, I have made your name, Father, known to those whom you have given me from the world. They were yours, and you gave them to me, and they have kept your word. Now they know that everything you have given me is from you. For the words that you gave to me, I have given to them, and they have received them, and know in truth that I came from you, and they have believed that you sent me. I am asking on their behalf. I'm not asking on behalf of the world, but on behalf of those you gave me, because they are yours. All mine are yours, and yours are mine, and I have been glorified in them. And now I am no longer in the world, but they are in the world, and I am coming to you. Holy Father, protect them in your name that you have given me, so that they may be one as we are one. It is the name of the Father that Jesus has come to hallow. And as he goes to his death and the triumph of the resurrection, the Father shares with the Son his very own name. St. Paul says, God also highly exalted Jesus and gave him the name that is above every name, so that at the name of Jesus every knee should bend in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord, Adonai, the very name of the God of Israel, to the glory of God the Father." Now we too pray with and in Jesus for the sanctifying, the hallowing of his Father's name. We pray that that name may be more widely trusted, known, and loved. And we pray that we may act more and more in ways that honor and reverence God's name in the world. We seek not to take the name of God in vain, but to hold it in such esteem that the world may know God's gracious character, his property, as the language of the prayer book says, always to have mercy on those who call on him for salvation. Thy kingdom come, Jesus prays. His entire ministry is one long forecasting of the day when God's kingly reign will come in its fullness. Here's what Jesus says in the Gospel of Matthew. If it is by the Spirit of God that I cast out demons, then the kingdom of God has come to you. Jesus tells his followers, indicating that in some true and profound sense, God's reign, God's kingdom, God's kingship has already broken into this present evil age. And in parable after parable and discourse after discourse, Jesus points to the time when the reign of God, which has even now been inaugurated, will eventually be consummated. When sin and death will have been finally overthrown, when sorrow and sighing will have fled and all tears will have been wiped away, when the already will give way to the not yet. You and I are invited, indeed we're exhorted, to join Jesus in praying for God's kingdom to come. All around us, we see signs that God's reign has not yet arrived in the way that it one day will. Wars, famines, illnesses, broken relationships, sins, rebellions, all these woes still haunt our planet. And we cry out, how long, O Lord? And as we pray for God's kingdom to be unveiled, we pray too that even now we may begin to embody something of what that kingdom will look like. As we feed the hungry, as we soothe the suffering, as we work for justice and peace in our little corners of the world, we pray that our efforts may be signposts of the divine reign, the divine kingdom on which we've set our hope. In the Lord, 
our labor is not in vain. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven, Jesus prays. We hear him pray that prayer, those very words in the Garden of Gethsemane before his arrest. My Father, if it be possible, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not as I will, but as you will. A person from church history who thought more deeply about this petition than anyone else probably is St. Maximus, the confessor, who died in the year 662. Maximus trusted that from all eternity, God the Son, together with God the Father and God the Holy Spirit, had willed the salvation of the human race. But now, as the God-man, Jesus Christ brings the will of his human nature into alignment with the eternal will of God. In so doing, Maximus says, Jesus showed us, quote, a wholly new way of being human. Christ, by his obedience as a human being, willed and carried out our salvation, Maximus says. It was not enough for God to will our salvation. St. Cyril of Alexandria says, if he conquered as God, to us it's nothing. But since he has conquered as the incarnate God, as the divine Son who is also human, then his obedience accomplishes our salvation. We too may now join Christ in submitting our human wills to the crucible of his divine love and find ourselves transformed in the process. Give us this day our daily bread, Jesus prays. And we see him there in the wilderness his body weakened through fasting as he stares at the rocks that look for all the world like they could be loaves of warm bread. But when the devil tempts him to bypass his father's timetable and transform those stones into bread now, Jesus refuses. He will trust God to supply him with the food he needs. And he quotes from the book of Deuteronomy, it is written, one does not live by bread alone but by every word that comes from the mouth of God. And in so doing, Jesus shows us, he, he teaches us what it means to depend on God for daily sustenance, what it means to look to God for the bread that we need each day. Do not worry, he says in his Sermon on the Mount, right after his instruction on how to pray. Do not worry, saying, what will we eat or what will we drink or what will we wear? For it is the Gentiles who strive for all these things. And indeed, your heavenly Father knows that you need all these things. But strive first for the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be given to you as well. Forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us, Jesus prays. Although himself without sin, he follows Israel to the banks of the Jordan to hear the fiery preaching of John the Baptist. And as his fellow Jews confess their trespasses and accept the baptism of repentance that John offers, Jesus too steps into the water in solidarity with the sinners of Israel. It is proper for us in this way to fulfill all righteousness, he says to John. And it is not the last baptism he will undergo. A few years later, he will once again be among sinners, in solidarity with sinners, this time nailed to a cross between two of them. His baptism this time will be a baptism of blood. And he will cry out to his father for forgiveness, not for his own sins, but for the trespasses of those he's taken to himself. Father, forgive them for they do not know what they are doing. And in that way, Jesus will open to us, to you and to me, the possibility of our forgiving those who sin against us. In company with him, in company with Jesus, trusting in the finality of his sacrifice for the sins of the world, we can relinquish our demand for vengeance. We can let go of our supposed right to repay evil for evil. 
And we can instead entrust ourselves to the one who died to vindicate his father's justice and forgive others even as we have been forgiven. Be kind to one another, St. Paul says, tender-hearted, forgiving one another as God in Christ has forgiven you. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil, Jesus prays. And with this petition, the father's answer to his son is no. It is, after all, the mission of the son to enter fully into the depths of human trials and misery. The Spirit of God drives Jesus into the wilderness after his baptism to be tempted by the devil. He's not spared that temptation. God leads Jesus into the agony of prayer in Gethsemane where he is tempted once again to forsake his calling. And ultimately, on the cross, God does not deliver Jesus from evil. Jesus says that he could appeal to his Father who would at once send legions upon legions of angels, and he doesn't. He endures the agony of death on our behalf. Jesus takes the sin of the world and the evil of death on his shoulders, and he bears them, and he bears them away. And the result is that we are spared the ultimate time of trial. We are delivered from the power of the evil one. The Son endures death for us so that we might have life. Jesus Christ enters fully into the vortex of our lostness and alienation, and we are thereby rescued and redeemed and put right before God. So now, friends, we may pray to be spared temptation, not, of course, in the expectation that we will never face trials or never experience the enticements of wickedness, but secure in the knowledge that no temptation however severe, will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. What more can we say to this than to pray the final doxology of the prayer? Thine, O Father, is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Thank you very much. Thanks.